Well, hello, and welcome to the National Ocean Service Science Seminar Series. My name is Tracy Gill. Today and for all Tuesdays through June 11, I am co-hosting a seminar series with Giammi Shrestha, Director of the U.S. Carbon Cycle Science Program Office. Giammi will provide some background on the series, introduce the seminars and seminar and speakers, but before she does, here are some logistics and related information. The presenters are fine with clarifying questions. Go ahead and type them into the chat box and they will address them when they can or at the end of the talks. If you are interested in getting a PDF copy or recording of today's presentation, uh, we will list the websites in the chat box um, and they, as well as links to the Soccer 2 reports. If you are not on NOAA's weekly science seminar list but you would like to, ble like to be, please email me at tracy.gill at noaa.gov and I will add you to the list. Folks in the room, please sign in and silence your phones. And now we will hand it over to Giammi Shrestha to introduce the seminar series, the title, and the speakers today. Giammi? Thank you, Tracy. Greetings, everyone. My name is Giammi Shrestha. I'm the director of the U.S. Carbon Cycle Science Program Office in Washington, D.C. And I am also the co-host of this webinar series today with Tracy Gale from NOAA. Today's seminar is the 11th in a 16-week seminar series titled From Science to Solutions, The State of the Carbon Cycle, which is focused on communicating the second state of the carbon cycle uh, report findings in relation to current and broader societal impact and solutions. This series is sponsored by the U.S. Carbon Cycle Science Program in partnership with NOAA. For those who don't know about the U.S. Carbon Cycle Science Program, we are an interagency partnership led by the Carbon Cycle Interagency Working Group. We coordinate and facilitate federally funded carbon cycle research with the science community, and we provide leadership to the U.S. Global Change Research Program on carbon cycle science priorities. We are one of the longest-running U.S. interagency partnerships in global change research, and recently celebrated 20 years of being in existence. Most recently, we led the development of the second state of the carbon cycle report with a diverse team of over 200 U.S. and international experts for over three years. The CCADL assessment underwent rigorous multi-draft peer review by the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the public, and 13 federal agencies and departments before its release in late 2018. On the occasion of Earth Day this year, we released a new metadata embedded website for this special assessment. The site is carbon2018.globalchange.gov. Please check it out if you have not done so already. On behalf of my colleagues, I would like to express my gratitude to Noah and Tracy Gale, as well as all webinar speakers, for making this 16-week week's webinar series possible. For your future reference, the recordings of prior webinars in this series are all available on the YouTube channel for the U.S. Carbon Cycle Science Program. All pertinent slides and details of the webinar series are available on the program website, which is carboncycloscience.us. Today, two lead authors of the State of the Carbon Cycle Report, Dr. Lori Bruhiweiler and Dr. John B. Miller from NOAA Global Monitoring Division in Boulder, will be providing an overview of the global carbon cycle and gaps in our understanding of the science. Both speakers uh, also um, serve as valuable members of many of our interagency science activities, both in the U.S. as well as internationally, and many of you already know them. Um, I will start with Dr. Bruhi Weiler's bio first. Dr. Lori Bruhi Weiler is a physical scientist at the NOAA Earth System Research Lab Global Monitoring Division in Boulder, Colorado. Her research interests include understanding past and future budgets of carbon dioxide, methane, and other greenhouse gases using atmospheric transport models and data assimilation techniques. Lori has spent her entire career so far at NOAA. 
beginning with her postdoctoral thesis on stratospheric chemistry at the NOAA Aeronomy Lab, now ESRL TSD. She went on to the NOAA Geophysical Research Laboratory where she worked with models of stratospheric chemistry and dynamics before joining the Global Monitoring Division Carbon Cycle Group. Lori earned her undergraduate degrees in physics and mathematics from the University of Texas at Austin and her PhD from the University of Colorado Boulder. Thanks, Lori, for, for being part of the series today. Um, I will also provide a bio of um, Dr. John Miller right now, who is our second speaker. Dr. John Miller works as a carbon cycle scientist with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Earth System Research Lab, just like Lori. John is also the chief of the carbon cycle greenhouse gases group at NOAA ESRL. His research focuses on the emission and absorption of the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere at regional and global scales. He uses both modeling of measurements of carbon dioxide and methane and their stable, radio, stable and radioisotopes to better understand the processes responsible for their source and sink variations. His specific interests are in fossil fuel combustion emissions of carbon dioxide at the national and global scales, the relationship between the Amazon forest and greenhouse gas emissions and absorption, and how these impact global climate. John received his PhD in chemistry from the University of Colorado in 1999, while the National Research Council postdoctoral fellow at NOAA from 2000 to 2002, and has been a research scientist at NOAA since then. He has been an author on 110 peer-reviewed scientific journals, journal articles. He has also been a contributing author for the World Meteorological Organization quadrennial assessment of ozone depletion the Inter-Government Panel on Climate Change, Fourth Assessment Report, and other, other international reports. Welcome, Lori and John. And we're so glad you're here with us. Now, Lori will start the presentation. Uh, John will deliver his presentation after Lori's. There will be a few minutes after Lori's uh, talk for uh, Q&A uh, via the chat box. Uh, and, Lori, and Tracy will moderate that. Um, Oh, it's Lori's turn. Lori? Okay, thank you, Gammy. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for the nice introduction, uh, which, of course, I wrote. <laughs> um, so today I have the pleasure of talking about Chapter 1 of the recent uh, Second State of the Carbon Cycle Report. This chapter was meant to be a very brief chapter that um, overviews what we know about the global carbon cycle. And today I'm just going to go over some of our findings. Um, next slide. So at this point, we're going to switch uh, formats um, because I was unhappy with with the way the titles looked. Okay, so um, I'm going to I'm going to organize this talk around the key findings of the chapter, and the first key finding uh, was that atmospheric carbon in the atmosphere, as we all know, has been rapidly increasing. Um, this figure here shows global observations, the global mean CO2 and methane um, atmospheric abundance for both CO2 and methane. And you can see the steep rise in atmospheric CO2 and the uh, varied rate of increase for methane, which I'll talk about in more detail later on. Um, so if we consider paleo data, CO2 has increased uh, by 40% since pre-industrial times from 280 to over 400 ppm these days. Methane has increased by 160% since pre-industrial times, going from 700 to over 1850 ppb currently. Um, this is something we know very well from atmospheric observations, so we have a high confidence in this. Um, our current understanding pins these increases on human activities, uh, especially fossil fuel combustion. And this is something we also know pretty well from our scientific understanding. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm the one that uh, advances the slide. Sorry about that. Um, so this is not in, shown in the report, but I wanted to show this just because I think this is really fascinating. Uh, if you look at the ice core data over the last 800,000 years from the EPICA project, 
uh, you find that the increases we see in the atmosphere today, which are the spikes at the, on the very right edge of this plot, you see that these increases are unprecedented over the last 800,000 years, which I think is uh, both alarming and fascinating. And you can also see here how um, methane and CO2 have varied over time in lockstep with temperatures. And so clearly, um, there is some kind of uh, relationship with CH4 and CO2 you know, forcing the climate in some way, although we don't understand all of the feedbacks and details in this time series. It's pretty clear from this interesting time series. I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, key finding number two, what is the impact of these increases in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere? Anthropogenic radiative forcing. Recall that anthropogenic radiative forcing is the change in radiative forcing since pre-industrial times. It is the um, changes we humans are having on the Earth's energy budget. Uh, the figure on the right is based on atmospheric observations that are summarized every year by my colleagues here at the Global Monitoring Division, the NOAA Aggie, the Annual Greenhouse Gas Index. Uh, what I'm showing in this figure is not the actual index. It is instead the radiative forcing, which is in watts per meter squared. And here we've broken it down into uh, contributions from each of the major greenhouse gases. And uh, there are a couple of interesting things about this figure. One is that CO2 totally dominates the picture here. It is the largest contributor to anthropogenic radiative forcing. And it is also, even over this limited time period, increasing very rapidly. Um, so currently, the radiative forcing, if you add up all these bars, is 3.1 watts per meter squared by 2017. Uh, and CO2 accounts for about 2 watts per meter squared out of this. The second largest contribution is um, from methane, which it gives you another half a watt per meter squared. And then you have lesser contributions from other greenhouse gases, such as uh, nitrous oxide, the CFCs, and then 15 minor industrial produced greenhouse gases. Um, if you add all this up, it comes to 3.1 watts per meter squared. In response to this radiative forcing, um, global temperatures have risen by over one degree relative to the 1880-1920 mean. Uh, and um, this estimate is subject to some variability. For example, if you screen out the variability um, coming from, for example, ENSOs uh, or El Ninos, then you, you uh, get a smaller number. But if you leave the ENSOs in there, you could actually get a larger increase with the relatively large 2016 El Nino included in the time series. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that emissions have global consequences. So even though the soccer report was about North America, we cannot neglect to understand the global budgets of these gases um, because emissions have global uh, rated of forcing consequences. And not only that, um, the, if you looked at the greenhouse gases over the US, a large fraction of that for both CO2 and methane would have come from other parts of the world. So even though we may be focused on understanding uh, our own neighborhood emissions, we cannot neglect the big picture, which are the global emissions, and hence the reason for including a chapter like this in the report. Um, just a side note, I have uh, captions that I've pulled from the report below each of these figures. I'm not going to read them, nor will I expect you to read them while I'm talking, but they are there for reference later on. Um, we discussed uh, the general picture for both the methane and the CO2 budgets in the report. Just to give background, we use these uh, fancy and complicated diagrams, which we obtained from the recent IPCC report to do this. Um, I'm not going to discuss all the things on this chart. You can um, read the details in our report or go to IPCC, but I want to point out a few interesting little tidbits here. First of all, there are actually two CO2, two carbon cycles. One is the slow geologic carbon cycle that has um, redistribution times of 100,000 years or more. Uh, and then there's a faster cycle that uh, operates on millennial time scale. So we really have two carbon cycles. We humans are short circuiting the geologic carbon cycle by burning fossil fuels. We're feeding, speeding up this um, carbon cycle by a factor of 100. 
which I think is a very staggering thing to think about. Uh, here's a table on the bottom here that kind of details uh, what we humans are doing on the top two rows compared to what we understand about the natural carbon cycle. And you can see that humans are um, putting more carbon into the atmosphere over time. And this extra carbon, some of it is staying within the atmosphere and uh, the other amounts of anthropogenic carbon is going into the oceans and the land as uh, we expect from our scientific understanding. Um, there's also the methane budget um, that we talk about it in, in fair amount of detail in this chapter. Here's a comparable diagram for uh, methane emissions. The thing I want to point out about the methane budget is that it is very uncertain. We often have, um, for methane, a lot of source processes that overlap in time and space. Um, humans have a wide variety of activities that can affect the methane budget in the atmosphere from how we produce our food to how we produce energy to how we dispose of our waste. In addition, there are natural sources which may be subject to changing as the climate changes. Um, and this would mean that, that methane could have climate feedbacks even as CO2 does as well. Um, unlike for, for CO2, methane has a chemical sink uh, that about equals the, emission, the global emissions. And this is why you can have a situation where methane doesn't have a monotonic increase. It can level off if the sources, the, the net emissions and the global sink come into equilibrium. And I'm going to discuss that more on the next slide. Um, I'm going to take a, a little deviation in, into the topic of methane at this point, um, just because I think it's a very interesting gas and because we still don't know very much about it. So I'm showing you here the global observations again. And we who work on uh, atmospheric methane divide this curve into three parts, the rapid growth part, the pause in the growth, and the renewed growth. Um, so the rapid growth and pause in growth, um, it was proposed by Duglo Gokensky a couple in a couple of papers that this was simply um, the global emissions and the uh, global chemical sink coming into equilibrium. So you could actually reach uh, kind of a steady amount of methane in the atmosphere. Um, there were many mechanisms besides this equilibrium idea that were proposed by people. Um, some people felt that you needed a reduction in emissions to achieve this, which is not necessarily true, although it could be true. And also you could maybe have a change in chemical sink. Um, more interesting these days is the period of renewed growth after about 2007, and there has been uh, a lot of literature about this recently. Um, some people have uh, proposed that microbial emissions are actually what has been changing. And uh, by the way, the change in the methane budget by now is about 40 teragrams higher than we were in 2007. Uh, when the methane emissions were about 550 teragrams per year. So we've really, this is a, a significant perturbation on what we understood to be the global methane budget. Um, so one idea, of course, is microbial emissions. Another idea was that it was actually agricultural microbial emissions. Um, some people have proposed that it's fossil fuels. And of course, uh, you know, we don't know a lot of details about the chemical sink, perhaps it was the chemical sink changing. Although chemical models are currently suggesting that OH is likely to have been fairly constant. Why would you think it's microbial emissions? Well, the isotopic data and, um, indicate that the atmosphere has been coming, becoming lighter as methane has been going up. This is a very strong hint that we're getting that um, the change in the methane budget is due to microbial sources. Uh, this data on the bottom panel comes from our collaborators, and in particular, Sylvia Mitchell at INSTAR, which is at the University of Colorado. Um, now, what are the microbial sources? Well, they're uh, animals, especially cows and sheep, rice agriculture, waste. Uh, the natural sources, on the other hand, are wetlands, um, insects, such as termites and roaches, and animals. If the recent increase is due to wetlands, then this is a very interesting question because perhaps climate change is uh, resulting in more production from wetlands. Uh, but the real picture is probably fairly complicated. There are probably room for 
concurrent changes in multiple processes. For example, if you go look at animal statistics, you see that um, animal populations have been growing. Uh, the, the most rapid growth is in goats and sheep, which emit less methane per animal. Um, many parts of the world can't afford to have a lot of dairy or non-dairy cattle. Uh, so that's why we see the largest growth in these smaller animals. But if you just consider the growth in animal populations and the emissions per animal, and of course these are fairly uncertain numbers, you can account for maybe about 10 uh, teragrams per year out of this 40 teragram surplus since 2007. So clearly you can't explain the entire methane increase with just animals. You also can't explain it with rice agriculture because um, changes in rice agriculture are likely to have been pretty small recently, uh, maybe uh, at most a teragram and a half. And the figure on the lower left from the FAO stat tells you why um, world production of rice uh, has remained fairly steady recently. Um, the harvested area has actually gone down, so this implies a certain amount of efficiency in rice production. Uh, but the differences are too small to really make up an appreciable part of uh, the increase in emission, emissions we've been seeing. So now the um, interesting and puzzling thing is wetlands, because currently our best idea of wetland extent comes from um, satellite inundation data, and yet the satellite inundation data is telling us that wetland uh, areas have likely remained constant or maybe even declined in some parts of the world. Now, of course, inundation does not necessarily equal wetlands because what you can have very productive environments in places where the soil is saturated right up to the land atmosphere interface. And some environments that are inundated, the water may be too deep for there to be a lot of methane emissions to the atmosphere because methane's oxidized in the water column. Um, so this is currently quite a puzzle. And it's one that many of us here at NOAA and NASA as well, we're working very hard to understand. Okay, so I'm going to, after that methane uh, diversion, I'm going to switch back um, to CO2. Key finding number three in this chapter had to do with changes in fossil fuel emissions. Global energy demand has been increasing fairly steeply. Uh, a lot of this increase, according to the EI, the IEA is driven by uh, demand from China and India, other developing countries. Um, about 72% of this rise is still being met by fossil fuel use. Um, however, this very interesting figure on the right shows that even as global GDP is continuing to increase, um, energy demand and emissions uh, have sort of leveled off in comparison. They're still rising but not as steeply as they were. And this indicates um, a couple of things, more energy efficiency and um, possibly more of a use of non-carbon uh, energy sources. Um, there, were, there have actually been declines in CO2 emissions uh, from some countries, such as the US, and this is due to more use of renewables, probably also a switch to natural gas, which is less carbon intensive than coal. Um, <clears throat> On the next slide, there's more detail about the decline in U.S. emissions here on the left. Um, you can see that um, some, some countries are still um, seeing increase in energy-related carbon dioxide, dioxide emissions. The U.S. is uh, recently showing some small declines. And the figure on the right is a, is a nice visualization of emissions uh, that I found in the New York Times a couple of years ago. And here you can see the relative shares um, and carbon emissions from uh, among different parts of the world. The United States and the European Union have sort of leveled off. It's interesting that Russian emissions uh, used to be higher, and then in the late 1990s or mid-1990s, they changed abruptly. Um, Chinese emissions have been increasing very rapidly, and now they're about double uh, U.S. emissions. So this is a, a pretty interesting figure on the right here. Okay, so um, key finding number five. This generated a lot of interest from reviewers. The thing about chapter one is that everybody reads it because it's the first chapter and it's pretty short and it's an overview. 
Um, almost uh, all batches of reviewers had a lot to say about this piece in the report, which is about how much more carbon we can emit and still stay below two degrees uh, Celsius. So one thing that's important to note is that some studies are suggesting that it's already too late. Um, on the other hand, um, you can still do a useful estimate, e hoping that this isn't the case. If you uh, look at what models and observations tell us about the sensitivity of global uh, average temperature to um, carbon emissions, you see that the range is 0.7 to 2.4 degrees Celsius per 1,000 petagrams of carbon equivalent. Um, now, if you want to have a 60% chance of staying below 2 degrees, um, you have to stay under 1,000 petagrams of carbon equivalent. Just a rough number, you can also explore the uncertainty limits as we did in, in detail in the report, but I'm just going to uh, use this middle of the road argument for now. We've already emitted most of this. We've already emitted almost 780 petagrams of carbon equivalent. This means we only have about 220 left to emit. If we're uh, emitting at about 11 petagrams per year, we could reach this in a couple of decades. If we want to take a bigger chance and um, spin the roulette wheel, then we could give ourselves more time. Um, but the disturbing thing, of course, is that this estimate does not include carbon cycle feedbacks. So um, it, it seems to me to be fairly risky anyways. Uh, so what I mean by carbon cycle feedbacks, I have some examples here on this slide. Um, one, it has to do with droughts and fire. So the ecosystems dry out, you have more fires. This increases carbon emissions and it decreases evapotranspiration. This leads to drier and warmer conditions and so on. That, that is uh, one feedback. Another one has to do with stratifying the ocean and reducing carbon uptake. And uh, finally, there's the intriguing one about uh, northern wetlands. As you warm the wetlands, you increase carbon emissions, and then you increase the temperature. And of course, there is a lot of carbon stored in high latitude wetlands. And if you want a, a number, you can look back at a previous slide on the, the global carbon cycle and, and see an estimate for the 1,700 petagrams of carbon that are stored up there. Um, so, of course, interesting questions is, are any of these climate feedbacks underway? Can we detect them? And um, if, can we understand and predict them accurately? These are all very important questions. And in particular, this is why we need long-term uh, measurements so that we can um, test our understanding against long-term records and try to see if we see any hints of these things uh, happening early so that we can influence <laughs> policy. OK, all is done. Um, carbon cycle feedbacks are very uncertain. And here are a couple of examples. Uh, on the, the left panel, I'm showing you model calculations where the carbon cycle is allowed to feed back into the climate. And of course, where it was constrained to not feed back into the climate. If you subtract those two uh, cases, you get the um, figure for CO2 on the right which shows the difference between coupled and uncoupled calculations. And you can see that the models show a very large range in atmospheric CO2 difference between these cases. Um, so the models disagree on the magnitude of carbon cycle climate feedback. On the right-hand side is some uh, nice work by Zhen Zhang that appeared in PNA PNAS in 2017. And this one shows an attempt to model future wetland emissions given different RCP scenarios. And of course, um, at the high, most drastic case of anthropogenic emissions, you can see that wetland emissions uh, may increase substantially. And there's large uncertainties of this on this, of course. So we need to understand uh, these mechanisms and how they're likely to change as the carbon cycle changes. And um, so that's it. I have here, I'm not going to read this all to you, but as a summary, I offer you the key findings from the report, which I've um, paraphrased and shortened. Uh, and later on, when we get the chance, I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you. Great. Great. Thanks, Lori. And I'm sorry to have rushed you. It's, just, it's, it's hard to get all that information into 22 minutes. So. Anyway, John, um, I'm going to load your slides.
And um, folks online, we're going to take questions at the end to, just to make sure John has time to present his work. Um, well, well, I'm sure we can go to beyond one, so I'm sure we'll be able to get to all the questions. John, go ahead. And you'll need to unmute your mic. For the reminder about unmuting, I just started to talk, so. Okay, um, but you can hear me now? Yep. Yep. Okay, great. Okay, so um, uh, I was the co-lead author along with Andy Jacobson. Um, who I saw was on the line earlier um, for Chapter 8 of Soccer 2, um, which was focusing um, also on CO2 and methane, but more from an observational point of view and also more from, an more from a North American point of view. So um, here, unfortunately, here, this is what the... Uh, the top of our chapter looks like, and this is really just a reminder of this is a picture of Mauna Loa, incidentally, um, on a nice clear day of the, of the famous Mauna Loa Observatory where the Keeling Curve comes from. This is just a reminder of, for me to mention that it wasn't just uh, Andy and me, but also several co-authors, unfortunately, in the conversion from PowerPoint to Adobe, this didn't come out very well, so I'll, I'll leave it to you to read um, the names later at your leisure. Um, so just a brief, uh, this talk is going to be pretty brief, and I'm really just going to talk about a few things. Um, the first is I'm going to talk about our key findings, um, and the second thing is the other, uh, one of the other main focuses of our chapter was to talk about the trends and future prospects and challenges for measurements for, and modeling systems in North America if we want to improve our ability to determine, um, to determine surface emissions and surface sinks of, of gases like CO2 and methane using atmospheric data. So that, that I'll, I'll first talk about key findings and then talk about that second topic about trends and future prospects. So this is very similar to what Lori's um, key finding number one was, um, which was that global CO2 and methane continue to rise. And see, uh, you'll see here on the uh, left-hand axis in red is methane. And as Lori said, we see this initial rise, a plateau um, between about 97 and 2006, and then a, a rise again after that. Um, whereas with CO2, the blue curve relative to the right-hand axis, we see a much steadier increase um, that's in the range of, of averaging somewhere around 2 ppm per year. Um, and one of the things that we added here just for reference uh, that's interesting are these two dashed lines that are vertical, where you'll see the first dashed line around 2007 is the publication date of Soccer 1, and the second dashed line is the publication date, what we originally thought would be the publication date of Soccer 2. And you can see that, um, I'll just use CO2 as an example here, is that we have um, a really big increase in CO2 just in the time period between Soccer 1's publication and that of Soccer 2. Um, in fact, um, we're looking at something between, you know, we're at, at the time that Soccer 2 was published, Soccer 1 was published, we were something like 100 ppm above pre-industrial. And by the time Soccer 2 was published, we're more like 120 or 125 ppm above pre-industrial. So that looked in, in that lens, we've the post-industrial increase has increased by about 25% just in the between the publication of these two documents. So that's a, a pretty shocking thing to uh, think about in a lot of ways. Um, so here what we've done is we've actually calculated um, using a simple Atmos Global 
atmospheric mass balance approach. We've calculated the sources and sinks for methane and CO2 um, based on those, on those curves that you see. So basically, uh, um, if you look at the, if you can imagine just thinking about what the average year-on-year -year increase is for methane or the year-on-year -year increases for CO2, um, that is what this uh, left-hand part of the equation here is. Oops, I, you can't see my mouse. I'm realizing that's what this is here. This, this, uh, this derivative here, this time rate of change, um, and that equals, just by mass balance, the sources. I uh, just put flux of methane minus its sinks, which is the concentration divided by the, the lifetime for methane. Um, and what you see is the red bars, and you see a highly variable um, amount of sources and sinks, but in the period after Again, with looking at the vertical dash lines in the period after the Soccer 1 report, since the Soccer 1 report is published, and that higher rate of increase, we see, we see higher uh, emissions, assuming a constant uh, lifetime for methane. And then for the last two years, we see an even higher increase. And then for CO2, we can write a similar mass balance, which is that we write the, the rate of change of CO2 is equal to the fossil, which we assume that we know, plus the land sources and sinks, plus the ocean sources and sinks. And you'll notice here in the, in the blue bars that these are all negative numbers. That is, globally, CO2 is being continually taken up, on average, by the Earth system. Uh, at the surface of the Earth. And what we see also is that there's a, a trend from the 80s to the present in terms of more and more CO2 is being taken up by the land and the ocean. This particular calculation doesn't attempt to separate land and ocean. But it's a reminder that as fossil fuel is increased, we still get, um, we're, we're still adding CO2 to the, CO2 to the atmosphere. But at the same time, we're also, uh, we also keep, or not we, but the, through no um, effort of our own, the surface of the Earth keeps taking up CO2. So this is key finding one, to which we assign a very high confidence level, because it's mainly based on, on data. And unfortunately, this kind of analysis, we can't apply to North America. We can only do so. Uh, using more sophisticated uh, models, um, and that's what we uh, that's what we did in key findings one and two. We didn't run models ourselves for this study, but we tried to look at um, we tried to look at a series of uh, published results for both CO2 and methane. So key finding two, um, key finding two focused on uh, CO2 uptake over North America. Um, and we focused just now on the time period over which we had uh, consistent um, quasi-operational model results. Um, so what you see in the graph here are you see CO2 emissions, again, negative numbers in teragrams of carbon per year. That is that all of the models pretty much report a sink a CO2, that is absorption of carbon, by the North American land surface. Um, and then you see the red is the boreal, the purple is the temperate, and the green is the sum of those, which is the total. Um, and temperate corresponds pretty well to what the United States borders are, not exactly. Um, and what we, the way we um, form these, uh, each of these curves here, if we just think about the red boreal one, for example, it's the average of four quasi-operational inverse models, which we're all using similar data input. Um, and for example, I think we use the uh, Carbon Tracker model, the um, Carbon Tracker Europe model, which is a variant of Carbon Tracker. And then we used 
um, a model from Germany and a model from, from France as well, an inverse model that are run on a regular basis. So um, all four models um, were used to form the annual average um, uptake numbers for each year. And um, the, one of the interesting things that we see here is that if we look at the green curve as a whole, we see that there's some indication of an increasing sink of carbon for North America over this time. Um, I, I, don't, I wouldn't ascribe high confidence to that because you can see that the, um, the error banding around those green curves is pretty significant. Um, so it, it's, it's still something that's, I would say, a, an indication or suggestion, but not a firm conclusion yet at this point. Um, one of the really interesting things to consider here that we found was you see now um, on this slide that this very thin blue bar um, that I'll point to here, that blue bar shows up, and that is the what the uh, US EPA um, reports to the UNFCCC, that is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, even though it's an interesting little note uh, that even though we have withdrawn or will soon withdraw from the Paris Accords, we're still bound by our treaty commitments to report um, fluxes of uh, fossil fuel emissions and additionally land use um, emissions. And so these are the land emissions that we report. And in bullet point number two, um, over this period that in the graph, they are minus 202, plus or minus only five teragrams carbon per year. Um, a lot of this has to do with how that number is calculated. It's calculated from the US uh, Forest Service repeat um, surveys of, of forests, which only happen every five to 14 years. And so they are going to get a very smooth view of what happens to the land. Um, and whereas if you compare the blue to the purple, which is, as I mentioned before, temperate is pretty similar to the US, it's highly variable. And so this, was, this is a, a, a really interesting difference that we found um, that, the, that what the atmosphere implies about what's happening um, is quite different than the, than the bottom-up perspective um, in terms of what we report internationally for our land fluxes. But overall, these, 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 um, these key, this key finding, too, was I don't think we ascribed very high confidence to it, but um, it's, it's, I think it was potentially high confidence. So the key finding three related to, um, related to methane. And um, what we saw here was something the opposite in a way that we replied for CO2, that we found for CO2, which was that um, in all, in both the boreal and temperate zones, that is the purple and the red, um, there was relatively little variability in the um, results for North America, for these North American zones from a collection of inverse models. In this case, this was not a consistent set of inverse models, but the best set of inverse models that we could get from the Global Carbon Project. Um, and in this case, they use both in situ and satellite data. On the bottom of the plot, you can see um, that these numbers starting at in 2000, 3, 3, 4, 6, 6, 6, 8, 8, 8, et cetera, refer to the number of models used to construct the average. So it's, you can see that it's not consistent, uh, but it still gives you a reasonable idea um, that there aren't big trends and uh, there isn't a huge amount of variability um, in either the boreal or the temperate version uh, regions. And this, of course, uh, is, is very interesting because there's been a lot of discussion in the methane literature about increases in the temperate region, especially for the United States, of methane emissions as a result of 
of hydraulic fracturing and uh, extraction and distribution and production of natural gas from unconventional oil and gas um, sources. So this is not seen in, the, in these uh, global model results. Um, the other really interesting result here is that, and this is actually something that I just realized now, but we that we did not note in the Soccer 2 chapter, was that the temperate totals that is in the purple are about twice that. They're about 50 teragrams per year, and this is about twice that that the EPA reports for the U.S. So the EPA only reports about 26 teragrams per year over this time period. And we, we, we see, or when we analyze the results of the global inverse models, they see about double that um, for, the, for the U.S. Okay, so the next section of the report is going to be about trends and future prospects. Um, I'll just get on to it. Um, so one of, the, one of the biggest things that we see is a big, uh, between Soccer 1 and Soccer 2 in this case, rough, we see two maps, A and B here. Um, on the left-hand side, the 2005 CO2 network for highly calibrated uh, CO2 measurements over North America, and then the 2015 network, we see a big increase in surface measurements, that is the orange um, orange dots. The only thing that decreases are some of the airborne flash data that we had a, uh, a brief period of uh, alongside with the uh, uh, North American Carbon Program's mid-continent intensive period. We had a lot of flash data at that point for aircraft. That disappears, but pretty much everything else increases. The other thing to note is whereas the left graph the left map has a lot of NOAA data in it. The right-hand map, NOAA data, is actually only a small component of it. And we're starting to see a lot more data from private companies, universities, and uh, Environment Canada for the Canadian zone as well. Um, into the future, we would hope that um, commercial aircraft observations, similar to, for example, the Japanese Contrail program, could greatly expand measurements over North America and other places in the world as well. And also, for example, if the National Ecological Observatory Network, or NEON, uh, program is built out as planned, that would add potentially 25 calibrated CO2 sites uh, to the network. Um, there's also remote sensing. So this is where, if you look on the cartoon in the right-hand side of the plot, um, You'll see a little tiny observatory, um, oops, right here, um, and that little that little observatory would house a uh, Fourier transform spectrometer that would look at the sun and try to see how many carbon dioxide and oxygen molecules are in the path length between it and the sun, and therefore calculate um, CO2 not just at a point but in a whole column above it. Um, at several places in the U.S. And then on the left-hand side, you see the map, the current TECON map, and there's a, a handful, a half dozen sites or so in North America um, where there are TECON sites. In addition to ground-based remote sensing, of course, there's uh, satellite remote sensing. This shows the June-July 2018 um, CO2 from the o o OCO2, NASA's OCO2 satellite. Um, the OCO3 satellite just was launched um, in the last week, um, and that will add more data. Um, one of the big challenges with the satellite data is to link it uh, to the very high quality ground data we have. And what I mean by link is that the, um, there's, there's something known as the World Meteorological Organization um, uh, calibration scales, and the satellite data cannot be put on the calibration scale very easily. So we need to do jump through a lot of hoops, including using TCON data and aircraft and a technology known as AirCore to try to link satellite data to ground-based data so that this can be used in concert. 
So trends and measurements and modeling, um, we're moving more towards multi-year regional, national, and continental inverse modeling. If you remember, the key findings were based on global models. But um, we see a, this is actually N2O. I guess it's not carbon, but it's an example of a, of a, of a multi-year regional model uh, that was published recently in 2008. Uh, Lei Hu from our group uh, published a, uh, a multi-year CO2 analysis using regional data and regional models for North America. Methane so far has currently been limited to shorter and regional studies, although that should be changing soon. And then there have been a lot of work on urban studies recently. There's the Indianapolis Flux Project, Influx, which has been lasting now for, I guess, getting probably close to 10 years. The LA Megacity Project, there's activity in Boston and in the DC and Baltimore area, Salt Lake City as well, I believe. And all of those, uh, all of those projects have both modeling and measurement components to them. Um, other tracers, in situ tracers that can help us um, understand the carbon cycle better. Radiocarbon is one of them because it's, this is important because it's sensitive to just the fossil fuel part of CO2 so we don't have to make the assumption that we know fossil fuel CO2 from an inventory. We can, and there's, we're in our lab, we're working on that. Other people are as well. Um, I'll, I won't go through all of these examples. Um, I will mention as well, um, that there are gases as well for methane, uh, associated tracers for methane that can help as well, and that all of these measurements, uh, with the exception of oxygen-17, already exist in North America. Um, and finally, I would just say really quickly, I want to leave time for questions, that also we need to uh, put effort into improving the model representations of atmospheric mixing and transport, because you, if we have, even if we have the greatest data, if we don't have great models, we won't really be able to uh, interpret the data properly to understand what the sources and sinks of the data are. And I'll just leave you with my summary and end there. Thanks. Okay. Well, thanks, John. Thanks, Lori, sorry you had to move this so through this so quickly. Um, Folks online, we'll start back up at the top. Lori, I think some of these questions were initially uh, directed to you. Uh, if you could read the question and then reply, if you wouldn't mind. So I'd start with David Appeller. Would you like me to read the question? Yeah, you can, you can read me the question. OK. David Appeller asks, nature emits more CO2 in a warmer world, right? Then how much of atmospheric CO2 increase is from the one degree warmer temperature? Well, that's a very interesting question. That one is about um, carbon cycle climate feedback. And um, that's not something we currently have a very good handle on. OK. I, I can, can I add to that? I would say that you know, right now, actually, globally, um, we know that the graph that I showed with the blue bars going down that actually we're still seeing evidence of a huge amount of absorption of CO2 um, despite warmer temperatures. So that's there, and there, but the, the, that graph exactly. So, um, but that doesn't mean that in some parts of the world we are getting positive carbon cycle feedbacks, like in the Arctic or the tropics, and that in other parts of the world we're getting absorption. So, so it's an excellent question, but. I'd say globally, on average, we're still getting more absorption. OK. Thanks. And then Rob asks, why does this project use is it petagrams of carbon while IPCC uses MMT of carbon? This is inconsistency added unnecessary communication problems for policymakers or as unnecessary. I, I don't know how to answer that. We just settled on uh, common units we were going to use in this report. and. Uh, what we used was uh, what, what we tend to use in the in the scientific literature, at least um, the literature that those of us writing the report were involved in. We could have definitely used different units. 
Okay. And Sasha Hararik asks, or says, there is an intraannual variation in methane, which indicates that it is being removed from the atmosphere during part of the year. What processes remove methane from the atmosphere? Um, yeah, so that, that's a good question. Um, I did not get a chance to talk about every, everything related to the, the methane budget, but I did mention um, at the atmospheric chemical sink. And um, the atmospheric chemical sink varies with, with uh, solar insulation so that in the summertime, um, the sink is faster. And that, uh, along with a balance of emissions, some of which also have a seasonal cycle and transport, which can vary seasonally, um, all those things lead to the annual cycle that we observe at our surface sites. It's, it's um, mainly chemistry, though, that, that has the strong variation that uh, produces the large seasonal cycle. Okay. Would plants growing like in the warmer time periods create, you know, create more, contribute to that seasonal cycle, Lori? Yeah. Like so, um, the in the case of methane, you have uh, oh, methane. wetlands that emit methane, and the wetlands warm up uh, throughout the summer. Um, if you picture the high latitudes, you know, you can picture the snow melts, the ice melts, the ground warms up, and the microbes become very productive, and so um, methane emissions tend to be their strongest late in the growing season. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking CO2, sorry. Well, um, yeah, and then we it's, with CO2, you have the, the fastest drawdown early in the growing season when plants are leafing out and so forth, and then later on, um, plants can become more senescent, and then respiration takes over. So you late in the growing season could have more uh, respiration than uptake by photosynthesis. It, it varies with the ecosystem, however. OK. Thanks. And then um, when John started, Pierre LeBlanc asked, is the large increase in methane emission due to permafrost melting? Well, that's a very interesting question. We don't believe that's uh, the case right now because that's not supported by our network observations. Because our network observations um, are global observations and we have sites all over the world, we can look at how the north-south distribution of methane is changing over time. If uh, emissions were rapidly increasing in the Arctic, we would see that the north-south gradient um, would, would get steeper in, according to the increase in emissions. Um, so right now, we don't think that, that um, there is much of a contribution to the methane emission increase coming from the permafrost. We do think that whatever is going on is happening in the low latitudes based on the spatial distribution of our data. Permafrost carbon, both CO2 and methane, is the current understanding has uh, emissions very slowly increasing um, over the next one to 200 years. Um, so the longer we allow the climate to warm, uh, the more trouble we may get from permafrost carbon. Okay. And then Lee Ma asks, is the carbon emissions from EPA estimated by bottom-up vegetation models? Um, <clears throat> that's a good question and I, that I don't know the answer to fully. Um, oh. I believe in one of the other um, uh, chapters in soccer in the soccer two report, where the focus was on reconciliation of bottom up and top down estimates, they might have attempted to um, answer that question there. Um, but it's it's actually a great question because the you know the EPA the EPA follows specific inventory approaches which involve uh, estimates from the um, from the from the USDA from for for soils from agriculture and things like that, but also from the Forest Service, and I don't know how how they relate to um, bottom up models. If it's if they get a if they get a similar number like a 200 teragram sink, and if they get also this very constant um, sink that doesn't vary year to year, I'm not sure. Okay, thanks. And then Pierre LeBlanc asks, how much of the CO2 is absorbed by the ocean, which is causing acidification of the latter? Our, our, rough, our rough estimate is that just, just as a, a rule of thumb, 
um, about half of what we emit um, into the atmosphere from fossil fuel emissions um, is absorbed, and half is half is absorbed at the surface of the Earth by land and ocean, and half stays in the atmosphere. And of the half absorbed at the surface of the ocean, on a year-to-year -year basis, it's roughly half-half between the land and the ocean. Okay. And David Appel asks, do carbon models give indication of when nature might stop absorbing more and more CO2, increasing the CO2 in, in airborne extract, airborne fraction? That's, that's, a, that's another great question. I think the, the answer to that is that there is actually right now in the state of the art models, there is actually a really big disagreement about when, not necessarily when they stop, but um, where they stop and where some, at, in certain times, where some sources become sinks or when, sorry, when certain places that are currently absorbing when they stop absorbing and become sources. And that is partially what Lori showed in, in one of her slides from that 2006 Friedlingstein reference, um, where you see a big distribution going out to 2010. Um, and it's worthwhile if you can get that on the screen here, um, because it illustrates it very well. Yeah, I'd like to add to this, John, and go back to the other question um, that David asked. You know, we, we do know how much CO2 we're emitting, ultimately. We, we know that pretty well, not exactly, but pretty well. What we don't know is, very well is um, how that gets partitioned among the natural sinks. And in addition, we don't know, we don't understand very well the feedback processes on those natural sinks. And so models right now disagree quite a bit um, on that. And I'm going to forward to the, the slide. I know where it is, hopefully. Um, the relevant slide That's is this slide. one. Yeah, and if you look at those two figures over on the left, um, and in particular, I'm going to bring use the arrow here, you can see that um, if you let the carbon cycle interact with the climate model versus keeping um, CO2 constrained, you, you get a big difference. Some models are saying we're going to have a lot more carbon in the atmosphere if we let the carbon cycle interact, presumably because the ecosystems are changing. They're not taking up as much carbon. There's more respiration, what have you. Um, on the other hand, some models are predicting relatively modest carbon cycle feedbacks. So the fact that, that there's so much disagreement with these models um, definitely tells you that maybe we don't understand the processes very well. One thing that could potentially help us is going back in time and looking at what the atmospheric record tells us about the past, where we do know um, the meteorology, we, we hopefully know the emissions and, and so forth. Maybe by having long time series of observations, as John described in his talk, we can untangle some of these things and improve these predictions for the future. Okay. Thank you, Lori. Um, Rob, Rob and David are typing two more questions. David says, thanks. And Rob says, thanks. And Peter Pierre says, thanks. So thanks. And uh, while I'm here, I, I tried to post the uh, talk for next week. Um, is uh, on May 14th is Arctic and Boreal Carbon, Key Findings from the State of the Carbon Cycle Report by Ted Schur. So we hope you can join us. Lori and John, thank you so much. Do you have any last words? And Gyami, how about you too? Well, thanks for everyone's attention and for the questions. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much for everybody's uh, attention and questions and 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 like I said, like I just to re-emphasize one technical point that Laurie said. I mean the, you know the uncertainty, in, in, from a climate point of view, the uncertainty in the carbon cycle moving forward is really a first order uncertainty, on the same level quantitatively as as we have in terms of cloud feedbacks, and other things. So 
it, it's not something that we can that we can just sweep aside and 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 ignore. Right. Um, if you're interested in getting a PDF copy or um, copy of this recording, Yami is going to uh, post these on the website in a few days. Uh, if you scroll back up, you'll see where they're uh, where she posts them. Right at the top, I think. Yeah, if you're interested, they'll be here. Just search on Soccer 2 Seminar Series, and you'll be able to find this terrific information. Well, thanks, Lori, and thanks, John. Yami, any last words? OK, I guess that. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. Hope you can join us next week. Bye-bye.